Welcome to this week's edition of Flashback Friday, your opportunity to get some good review by listening to episodes from the past that Jason has handpicked to help you today in the present and propel you into the future. Enjoy. Speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big-time personal brand, and become the go-to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Hey, it's my pleasure to welcome Brian Kane to the show. He is a fantastic podcaster. He's the host of his show named ProfitCast. Awesome name. And he's got some great ideas and suggestions for podcasters on how we can all be more successful and how we can develop that intimate, loyal relationship with our listeners. And we're just going to dive right in with Brian. So, uh, Brian, welcome. How are you? Thank you, Jason. Man, doing great. Thank you so much for having me on. Really, good. really the appreciate pleasure it. pleasure is all mine. And uh, looking forward to learning some good stuff. There's some great content on your show and your blog. You know, just wanted to uh, kind of start, you know, maybe we can start, Brian, with some tips on on how people can gain listener loyalty. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's funny because there are quite a few tips. There's a lot of them out there. You're going to hear them all over the place. But I've got five that I love that I I thought were really great as far as this is something that's going to stand the test of time, something that's going to take a little bit of time to work on. It's going to be about building those relationships, but it will help. So, all right, let's do five. Uh, My first one is, is really interacting with your listeners, getting down, building relationships, answering every email, you know, just, just being a friend of these people. Because how many podcasters do we know really interact with their listeners on a personal basis, answer every email? It's, you know, it's a small percentage, but, but those that do it really succeed well, and it's neat. I think the idea of outsourcing your social media to some guy in the Philippines, when someone comments on your, uh, your Facebook page or tags you on Twitter or whatever, and they respond with some generic dumb response, that's probably yeah. not going to qualify as interaction. And I think the listeners can tell, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I was connecting with a guy that uh, is a podcaster that I love, and I, I've always appreciated this podcast. And I wrote in, I don't usually write in very often. Personally, I'm one of those people that just, you know, I might respond on social media. But I decided I'm going to craft an email because it meant something. This podcaster meant something to me. I sent in this email. And, you know, I was very personal about it. And I I shared some wins and and struggles and also just a a thank you for what he's done. And I got an automated response saying, one of our team will be in touch with you. And I never heard back from him. And I thought, man, that was disheartening. You know what I mean? And I know he's a big guy and he's got a lot, you know, but it just, it really kind of disappointed me because I put a lot into that email and I, I, you know, people want to be heard. And so when you can validate them being heard and respond to them, and give them value and share that on your podcast. Oh my gosh. Talk about turning somebody into a star. <laughs> I agree with you. As podcasters, we have to realize, you know, we're not big celebrities, right? This is not, <laughs> yeah. it's it's not yeah. like, you know, you uh, go on, uh, you know, John Travolta's blog or a Julia Roberts or something, and you post something on their Facebook page and you expect they're not going to respond personally. I get that. I, you know, I, I don't, you know, as much as I'm stalking Taylor Swift, she's just not going to respond personally. (laughs) Okay. Darn it. (laughs) But a podcaster is a niche celebrity in a certain small area, which is fine. That's what podcasting was, was made pretty well for. Right. You know, I mean, podcasters should be responding to their own stuff. Right. Oh, I agree. I agree. And even when you get too big, you know, and you you do need the help of people in the Philippines, like you're saying, then there needs to be some stuff that's responded to and other things that, you know, you need to do personally one way or the other. And that just has to be defined. Okay. So any other tips on interaction? I mean, you know, the social media, the Facebook stuff, uh, the emails, uh, anything else? Well, you know, this was a big one that I have to say that, that most of us have a struggle with is being yourself because we are being told by so many different, you know, forces in this world to be someone we're not. Or, you know, do this, do this. This is the next logical step for you to do. Or, you know, stop being so energetic. I got told that when I was on radio. It was pretty funny. Uh, you know, it's like, wow, you, you don't, you're not supposed to hear that. So being yourself. Be more boring. Oh my gosh. <laughs> 
So being yourself is key. I mean, you've got strengths, talents, you've got your own personality, you've got your own passions, desires, et cetera. Be that person and try not to be someone you're not. Live the life you were meant to live. I mean, be the, be the best you. That To me, that's so important. You know, another thing is speaking directly to the listener. We talked about this with interacting with your listeners, but even when you're talking on your podcast, so this is a really, it's a fine line here and it's a very subtle thing. But you know, when you say, hey, thank you all for listening. What you should be is you should be saying thank you for listening because you all implies that the person that's listening on the other end is a group. But in reality, even though you might have, you know, 100,000 listeners, one person is still receiving that at a time. And so each listener matters. Speak to a listener, not to the listeners out there. Oh, okay. So how do you say that or phrase that exactly again? Every time, like you're just talking to me right now, how do you phrase that? Not how do you all phrase that or, or like one thing I used to hear a lot was, uh, how are you all doing out there in podcast land? Or, or I, you know, let's pose an answer or question to the listeners, you know, stuff like that. So it's very impersonal. So looking at it, like you want to say, how are you doing today? How was your Thanksgiving? Thank you so much for listening. I've got a question for you, stuff like that. Right. Okay. That's good. And, and, you know, if you think about it, really podcasting is, is one of the most personal forms of yeah. media because you're usually right in their earbud. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Literally, exactly. you could not be closer. Sometimes I say that to my dog. I say, Coco, if you were any closer to me, you'd be on the other side of me. Okay. <laughs> you know? and, and that's really true. We are very close when we're podcasting. Television isn't that way. A book isn't that way. A movie isn't that way. And that might sound weird, you know, like, what's the difference? Well, it is. It feels more intimate when you're right in someone's ear. So uh, I think that's a, that's a good point. And, and you're small enough to where you can be personal and it's actually believable. If Leonardo DiCaprio comes on my TV and says, thank you for watching me, I know he's talking to like millions of people, sure, okay? Sure. But, but when it's a podcaster, you know, they know you've got a, a relatively small, narrow audience. And you may not know every person, of course, you know, and especially if you've got quite a few listeners, you're never going to know all the people. But at the same time, you're still talking to an in individual listener and each person does matter and wants to be heard. Again, it goes back to that. So, you know, and that also goes into empowering them to be involved with your podcast. That's a huge thing. Like, I love listener feedback. I love when people are sharing wins or struggles or questions or comments, whatever. I love hearing it and I love sharing it on the show. And if I could get everybody to leave voicemails, I'd be enthusiastic. I'd just be ecstatic about that. You know what I mean? So that's the kind of thing I enjoy. And then the last thing I would share is just engaging with listeners on social media, which, yeah, I know social media is a big thing, but I, I believe in building relationships on social media. Personally, like I like Facebook groups, Facebook pages, on the other hand, not so much of a fan of because it's it's less personal. So tell me about the way you use a Facebook group. It's a group, so people have to actually join it, even though it could be a public group or it could be a private group, or it could be a secret group. Facebook also just kind of slapped everybody recently with their, their pages. And I got to tell you, I think Facebook might be overstepping their bound. They might, you know, they, they're, they're making some people pretty upset. I mean, they've done that many times, you know, with privacy issues and so forth. Man, their business is advertising, so they better keep advertisers happy. Well, you know, when I first got onto Facebook, and this was, you know, after it went from the, the college groups to the public at that point, I just remembered that, you know, when you posted something, your friends would see it. And, you know, if you had a, a Facebook page back then, if you posted something, people saw it. And then I went away from Facebook for a while because I was just kind of getting fed up with the changes. You know what I mean? And then I came back and I started getting back on and I started working on our, our Facebook groups. I mean, our Facebook page for a radio station I was doing. And I noticed that nobody saw it. And I'm going, what is going on here? And then it, the whole timeline thing. And I started realizing at that point, Facebook was about a popularity contest. You had to game the system in order to make it work. It just, it was ridiculous. It was less about personal connection and all about this whole advertising medium now. And so that's kind of when I looked at the page as, yeah, some succeed, but most fail. Whereas Facebook groups, on the other hand, they're still successful because in many ways, a Facebook group is like what Facebook used to be. You post something, people see it. Because it's a private group or if, even if it's a public group, like you said, people still have to join it and they're going to get the notifications and they're there for a reason. People don't join a Facebook group just to join a Facebook group. They might like a Facebook page just for the heck of it and then never come back. But with the group, they're there for a reason and usually they'll engage with you. And that's something we've seen with our, our TV show podcasts is we started a Facebook group for both of our TV shows that we podcast about. 
People are excited. They come in and they share and they communicate. And we've built incredible friendships through Facebook groups. Yeah, yeah, good. That's great advice. I really like that advice. You're not the first person I heard it from. It's it's good advice, and I'm, I'm really believing it. Let me give an example of engagement that just happened to me this morning, so I thought I'd share it. Well, you're not going to believe this, but I finally started, Brian, asking my listeners for reviews. <laughs> really? <laughs> after oh. after what, seven, eight years now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I finally, uh, I finally decided it was okay to just actually overtly ask people to review the show. So listeners, please review my show. And Brian, I'm sure you're asking the same thing. Please review his show too. I got a really nice compliment on one of my public pages uh, for one of my shows today, the jasonhartman.com one. And a guy named Kent, he says, great interview, Jason. I really enjoyed this one. I had the founder, you know, this is me. I had the founder of Ugg Boots on the show. And wow. he, he was a great interview, great entrepreneurial yeah. story. And, um, you know, rags to riches for sure. And I said, thanks, Kent. Glad you enjoyed the show. We'll keep them coming. If you haven't done so already, please review the show. And I give my review link. And then he says, already done a few weeks ago. Keep waiting to hear mine read on the air. Smiley awesome. face. <laughs> and I'm like, do you think outsourcing that to a guy in the Philippines could have ever had that interaction? No. That's a really valuable interaction. It's yeah. exactly what you're saying, you yeah. know? That's how you get loyal listeners for life. That's true. And you know what's funny is, is reading reviews on the air. That's something that I had recently heard a few months ago and I'd never thought to do that before. And I thought, man, we, we need to do that. Like all of us need to be, because they're leaving something that is public. Why not? It's an, it's an honor. Yeah. And you mentioned gaming the system and, you know, after we're done with these points, I yeah. want to talk to you a little bit about that because you had some really good thoughts on that, but, but go on, let's, let's just uh, finish up on, on this topic. Well, first. actually I finished my, my five points. So, oh, okay. Well, yeah, I unless you had any points. other questions, but, uh, well, I mean, you know, I've got a ton of, <laughs> there, there's so many ideas, but those are my top five anyway. So Ryan, where's the bonus points now? Oh, are, are we oh. supposed to say now, but wait, okay. there's more. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> The, the bonus points, well, part of the bonus points are coming, which is exciting. Yeah. But okay, I'll, I'll share with you one thing and let, let's get into this one. So this is something that I thought was kind of revelationary for me. And by the way, thank you for being on ProfitCast this last week. Yeah, and pleasure. it was such, such an honor having you on. And I'll tell you what, between our conversation and, and then uh, I interviewed a guy, Lou Mangiello from the Walt Disney Podcast. And, and the two of you back to back, it was funny talking with both of you. He had some stuff about building relationships. And then, of course, you just had a whole wealth of, you know, ideas and knowledge and wisdom and everything. And so I got to thinking about some of that. And one of the things you brought up was finding that common enemy that we have with our, our listeners. Like, what is it that, what's that social injustice, you know, that, that movement that we're trying to do, that we're trying to fight against? Something that'll get people really riled. Seriously. And, and you know, I started ProfitCast with the idea of saying... I'm going to find out what it really takes to monetize a podcast and grow your audience and really interact with your listeners. That was the purpose behind ProfitCast. I was told by, you know, experts, there's already guys out there doing it. This is saturated. And I thought, well, yeah, there are guys out there talking about it, but what can I do that's different? And so setting yourself apart is one thing. But, you know, one of the things I came to the conclusion of is, is when you mentioned that common enemy idea is that what is it that we're fighting against? And I thought, am I fighting against making money? Like, how do we make money? And, and we're fighting against that? No, that's not it. You know, that's, that's a result of something. Or what about, well, we can't grow our audiences. Are we fighting against the, the small podcast syndrome? No, that's a result of something as well. And what I came to the conclusion of is that the problem we deal with, our common enemy with, with ProfitCast is the average. And it's that, you know, we're just another person, another face in the crowd. We're average. We punch the clock every day. You know, we, we, we live our lives on autopilot. You know, we have an average outlook, whatever it is, you know, and I came to this idea of saying we need to have a cure for the average. And it's this idea of saying, what about our presentation? Is our presentation average or are we excellent? Are we practicing in front of the mirror, in the shower, in the car on a daily basis? Are we like we would for a speech? Oh, my gosh. Yeah. You know, if we were getting paid to do this or we got hired by, you know, Howard Stern or something to be his co-host or, or whatever, you think we're going to wing that? We're, we're going to bust our butts. You know, we're going to get out there and we're going to try to be amazing at what we do. And we're going to practice at every opportunity we get. We're going to master our craft. And that's something that as a pianist, as a musician, you know, I have a passion for mastering things. Um, I believe in excellence. You know, I don't believe in, in being perfect because that's pretty much impossible. But you can be dang near excellent and, you know, really work hard at it. But that's kind of what I was looking at is that there's so many aspects to our podcasts and in life in general 
you know, when, when you basically, you're tempted to be average and average is comfortable. It's not fun, but it's, it's comfortable. Mm -hmm. And so my, my new thing that I'm, uh, I, like I said, inspired by you, that common enemy, I believe is really fighting against that average when it comes to our podcasts, because if we can create excellent podcasts, all of the strategies of monetizing and growing our audience are going to come pretty dang easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a really good point. Average is the enemy. You know, it reminds me of that famous uh, saying, we have met the enemy and the enemy is us. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so that's a good point. Average is the enemy. So we've got this world of, dare I say it, average podcast. Some are yeah. lame. <laughs> some are great. Yeah. Some yeah. are truly lame, though. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what's What's disconcerting about it is I, I just, I am concerned that the podcast consumer out there, and I know, I mean, of course, I'm a consumer. I love listening to podcasts. I mean, it's so much better than talk radio where you've got 18 to 22 minutes per hour of non-content of commercials, yeah. station ID, whatever, maybe the traffic report that doesn't even apply to you. You have GPS. Why are we still talking about traffic reports? Yeah. You know, when most, the vast majority of people have GPS, right? That mm -hmm. tells the traffic and you know, you can never in a big metro area tell the traffic where you are anyway. It's just silly. Yeah. So podcast, it's a much better medium. There's much more content. Mm -hmm. It's much more narrowly focused. It's just far more appealing. And once once the world discovers podcast, I think talk radio basically will be the, the old dying medium. And they only have a limited frequency spectrum anyway, so mm -hmm. you can never have as much variety and as much of a long tail in terms of key, keywords and very specific narrow interest. So here's the thing, though. You know, when a consumer goes on iTunes or Stitcher or whatever platform they're using, and they see all of these podcasts and they've all got five star reviews and flattering comments. And you turn some of them on and you spend your all too valuable time, the most valuable asset anybody has. You listen to them and you think, this is co what's considered a five star podcast. Yeah. The consumer yeah. is going to get turned off. I'm telling you, people. I mean, do you agree with me? I don't know. Yeah, no, I agree. You know, and I, and that's funny that, that we're talking about this because that's been a concern of mine. <laughs> Thankfully, the people that I've interviewed haven't mentioned a lot of the whole, you know, leave the five-star reviews. I mean, that's something that it is mentioned simply because that's what we're taught, right? So we repeat what we're taught. And that's something that I've even taught others as well. Go get five-star reviews. But the thing that, uh, you know, one of the things that I try to get people to say is get a five-star honest review. Like, and if they can't leave you a five-star honest review, then have them leave a four or a three-star honest review or not at all, you know, but don't just go leave a review just because. And, you know, for example, we, we got a, we got two one-star reviews recently for one of our TV show podcasts and they were, they were just inappropriate. You know, they were disrespectful. It was just from two haters who just went all out on us. And the interesting thing is that it wasn't one star because of the quality of our show. It was a one star because they didn't like our show. It was it was not for them. It was the format that they didn't like. And I'm like, we're not trying to appeal to those people. So in some ways that was honest, right? And so some, but, but the way they worded it is somebody going and looking at that one star review is going to think this is a crappy show. But then we got later a four star review from somebody who said, I love this show and I love this, but here's some constructive feedback. You know, here's one thing that if you tweak this, it would be better. Here's another thing that if you tweak this, it would be better. And I thought, man, that's the best review we've ever gotten, you know, because it was honest. And I think that, you know, when we're trying to go, I'll just leave me a review. Oh, yeah, I'll leave you a review, but I don't listen to your show and I have no idea what it's all about. But I'll just leave you a five star because I like you. Yeah, then then maybe base it on I love this host and I love the topic and this person knows his stuff or whatever. And then that's it. You know, but don't say that this is the best show ever if you don't even listen to it. So I would agree. I think that there's definitely some... Like you said, it's gaming of the system, but I also think that it's it's how iTunes plays the game. They look at how good your artwork is. They look at how many, I hate to say it, how many five stars ratings and reviews that you have. And yeah, they do factor in the downloads that they get to see. So there's there's a combination, but I noticed that whenever I get a couple of extra five star ratings and reviews, my ranking bumps up immediately. So it is something that iTunes does. And so the game... I don't know if the game's necessary or not, but at the same time, it is a factor. 
it's not not a great factor, but it is what it is. So I, I don't know. I don't know what like how, how do we get around that? That's kind of the question that I'm trying to figure out right now. Well, what when I said that, what I was really referring to is not the concept of even if a host goes on and says, you know, I like I've just started saying, please review the show. And I'm thinking I want to start doing an ethical bribe to review my show because one of my other fellow podcasters who's got a zillion more reviews than I do, and uh, his show is good, but, you know, he's asking for reviews, right? And I'm, I haven't been doing it. I'll admit it's a bad practice. I should have started asking a long time ago. And so, you know, what he does is he, uh, he'll have a guest on the show and he'll get a bunch of their books. I don't know if the guest will send them some or he'll buy them. And he'll just say, hey, you know, write a review and I'll send you their book. They can write a crappy review and hopefully he'll still send the book to them. I don't know, you know. You know, that's okay. But what I'm talking about is where you've got these syndicates going where people are like reviewing each other's shows. And I'm like sort of loosely participating in one of those, okay? But I actually will take a little bit of time and I may not listen to their entire catalog of shows, certainly. I'll take like three episodes And I'll sort of skim through it. I'll listen to a few minutes here and then I'll forward it a little bit. If it's interesting, I'll just keep listening. And then I'll forward it. I'll listen to more. I'll I'll try to give like a legit review. You know, I might give them a four star review or even a three star review. I'm probably not going to give them a review if it's lower than that. Most people that are on those kind of things, they're taking it seriously. So they're going to have at least a three star show. But I I just I got to think the consumer is going to get turned off. If, if they can't believe these reviews, and we all know, and the consumers aren't stupid, okay? They know a lot of the reviews are fake, I'm sure. You know, you go on Amazon to buy a product, and it's the same thing. But from reading the comments, you can rationalize, you know, this looks legit, right? Or it doesn't. I, I just think it's bad for the whole industry. If the consumer can't trust the reviews, and they think a really mediocre two or three-star show is a five-star show, they're going to listen to it, turn off and do something else. They're going to be listening to Audible instead. And I think that's kind of the, you're right about that. And that's kind of what, what frustrates me too, is that we, I think we're getting backed into that, that corner though, where in order to get ranked on iTunes, you have to have reviews. And I, and I mean, not only that, but that is a major factor. And so I think a lot of people are saying, well, I want to be in the top 20 if I want to get noticed. So I'm going to do whatever it takes, even if it's not the best practice or the most I don't know if it's unethical is more of it's just, like you said, it's misleading for those who actually want to know what this show's about and want to read the reviews. And you're right. You can see the reviews that are like, that's crap. You know? Yeah, yeah. I think everybody just needs to know, look, there's going to be consequences to this. But anyway, we'll, 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 well see. Well, iTunes yeah. has started implementing consequences. Oh, tell me about that. I don't it's, know about this. Well, apparently, because what people were doing was going and getting, you know, a, a big number of reviews, you know, go out and get 50 reviews a day or 100 a day or something like that. And iTunes cracked down and said, nope, you can't have that many reviews in a day because you're gaming the system. So uh, a friend of mine who was a podcaster, he actually had, I think, seven reviews in one day. And he just did, it was the day he broadcast his episode. He he asked for it. He didn't game anything. He wasn't bribing anybody. This were actual, you know, seven legitimate reviews. And they came to him and said, sorry, that's too many reviews for one day. And he said, what are you talking about? These, I didn't even know these people did this. And they said, well, sorry, we deleted them and they're not going to be on there. So they've, they've overcompensated. Well, that's, that's yeah. a little scary. See, yeah, you know, yeah. But there you go. The consequences have already started. So. Right, right. And, and so that ruins, it, that ruins the party for everybody. Exactly, so, yeah. yeah. So do it right. That's the key. I'm with you on that. So, Brian, tell the listeners a little bit about your background, because I want to ask you to share maybe some advice from your, your background as to, you know, how people can be better at the actual act of podcasting, you know, the recording, the presentation, the vocal variety, things like that. You're, you're very good at that. Well, thank you. You know, I've done radio and I've done private events and as a performer with music, you know, I've been in front of crowds and stuff. So, you know, over the years I've just gotten to know, well, I've gotten to read body language and you start to realize when, you know, people are yawning and bored and getting turned off or you're losing them or are they really engaged almost impossible to do with podcasting because you can't see your audience so one of the things that you know i learned with radio is is well what are we doing we're we're talking to ourselves in a studio you know but you start to realize that you know you, you have to learn there's a lot of factors you have to learn how to speak to somebody you have to learn how to keep it interesting because there's a lot of monotone people 
And especially when they get behind the microphone, they get a little nervous and they start talking like this and how are you? And here's what I did. And they go on for 30 minutes like that. And it's boring, right? We talk about body language being something like 70 something percent of communication. But when we're behind the microphone, that doesn't exist. And so uh, ironically, the content is not the next high percentage. The next highest percentage is our intonation, our delivery, how we speak the words, then content. And so a lot of things I, I think podcasters miss on is how do we present in a way that is it's going to resonate, it's going to connect, and it's going to be interesting. And so uh, having done radio all those years, I was trained by people on how to speak. And I actually got trained on how to sound like the radio guy and be the amazing thing. And, and a, <laughs> <laughs> now you sound like a pitch man. Oh, yeah. my gosh. It was funny because they, they, ta- they taught me to talk like that. And eventually one day I went, this is ridiculous. I sound like a used car salesman. Like, I don't want to do this, you know? Nothing against used car salesmen. Sorry, I just had to. <laughs> a used car salesman announcer. There we go. The commercial. That's what I meant. But it was funny because, you know, I just went, this is so fake. It's not me. It's not how I talk to my friends. I want to talk to my friends. That's what I want to do. That's what I'm doing behind the microphone. And I learned it when I was doing some private events. You know, being a radio DJ, sometimes you get called on to do weddings and other things like that. And so one day I just realized that I thought, these are people. These are human beings. Why am I trying to elevate myself to some weird sound? You know, why don't I just be myself and I'm going to talk to them? But I'm going to talk to them with quality. I'm going to learn how to articulate my words. I'm going to use intelligence, you know, when I speak. I'm going to try to minimize ums and uhs as much as possible. Any tips on doing that? I'm terrible. When I listen to myself, it's amazing because it it seems as though when I'm recording a show, I don't do it. Um, uh, uh, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But when, when someone's interviewing me, I have um, ah, and I hate this one. You know, oh, yeah. I constantly say, you know, I, it's a terrible habit. How do I overcome that? Oh, I'm sure I'm not the only one with this problem, listeners. So I'm asking for all of you too. <laughs> yeah, this is a tough one. It takes it takes time. It takes attention. And it takes you not beating yourself up when you do it. Because as soon as you beat yourself up the first time, then you're going to keep doing it. Because it's just going to it's going to be the top of mind attention. What is it? Is my brain a rebellious teenager? Exactly. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You say, um, and you go, oh, dang it. And then you say it again and again and again. It just keeps going over and over. It's funny. So, and then another thing that's that's really important, and I know some people really don't enjoy doing this, but preparing what you're going to say somehow. I'm not saying you have to write out detailed notes. Some people need a script. Some people need an outline. Some people just need bullet points just to make sure, hey, I'm on topic. I know what I'm talking about. It's easy for most of us to go down rabbit trails. So really knowing what you're going to talk about and, and thinking about it and making sure it's coming to mind. And if... If you have no idea and you're recording, hit pause and stop and think about it. Don't try to push through it and then start over. Um, if you're doing it live, you know, sometimes you just say, that's a great question. I don't have an answer right now. I'm going to come back to that. And maybe you don't come back to it. Maybe you have no answer. You know what I mean? But not trying to fumble through something that you just aren't prepared for. So I think that's a big thing. I mean, it's just like a speech. You're not going to go up and wing it probably. Like, you know, you brought that up earlier. Right. Yeah, so, yeah, no, in a speech, uh, most people prepare for a speech, but on a podcast, for some reason, people don't practice. What about uh, show formats? Any advice on that? Of course, you know, most people are just interviewing guests. There's the monologue format. I do both. It mm-hmm. seems, though, nowadays I'm doing way more guests. I used to do a lot of monologue yeah. and uh, always get in front of that microphone and think, oh, you know, I've only got about maybe five, eight minutes here. And suddenly, like 30, 40 minutes later, I'm still talking talking yeah. to myself. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yeah, <laughs> it always works. It is. it is. Well, so you're wondering like, what's a, what's a good format? Yeah. And any advice on different formats and your thoughts about them? You know, the biggest advice I'm going to have here is do what you want to do and do what you're comfortable with. Because, you know, we, we all talk about, oh, John Dumas got out there and started the interview format. Now everybody's copying him. You know, and I, yes and no, some are definitely copying him. And, and I, just because somebody has an interview show doesn't mean they're copying him. So uh, I agree he's done a phenomenal job with it. But, you know, going back, for example, I, I've been doing interviews on radio long before John got behind a microphone. Yeah, I so, was doing interviews before John, too. I mean, boy, exactly. weren't, wasn't every podcaster doing interview? I mean, come on, he didn't invent the concept of the interview. No, exactly. And I, but I think <laughs> everybody's got this idea of that now everybody's copying him. And I thought, well, yeah, there are copycats, but you know, you can't say everybody's doing that. So I think 
it goes back. Like I love interviewing people because I did it on the radio and I love to interview artists and bands. It was so much fun for me. So I thought that's something I want to do with my podcast is interview people. And it had nothing to do with John Dumas. That was what I wanted to do. So, and I was good at it. It's something I enjoyed doing. And so I, again, it comes back to, if you really have a passion to interview somebody and you believe it's going to deliver value to yourself and to your listeners, go for it. If it isn't, and you really don't want to interview people, then don't. Like, yeah, it's a six, it's a, it's a great idea for a successful format, but it doesn't have to be an interview show to be successful. So I look at it as that what, again, going back to whatever it is you want to do, but as far as length, here's something I'll tell you. The average commute time statistically is about 26.4 minutes. And so that's something to factor in for the length of your show. And I know some people love going into the hour, hour and a half, and I don't have a problem with that. But I, I think, again, it comes down to make it as long as it needs to be. And so if your show is an hour, like last week, we talked for close to an hour on my show and every bit of information in there was necessary. Even trimming it down, there was nothing else I could trim out without taking out in, like intentional content. And so for me, make your content intentional. If it becomes fluff or rambling or whatever, edit it. Take it out. Don't just leave it in there. I, I would agree with you completely. I can't stand the rambling. Yeah. You know, some of these podcasts I listen to and they're talking about, hi, how you doing? You know, how's your cat? Oh yeah. my gosh. It's, you know, I keep saying like that old Wendy's commercial, where's exactly. the beef? <laughs> Seriously. And I mean, and connecting with your listeners is good and sharing a little bit of your personal life is good, but you're right. Get to the point. People, people's time is valuable. And so, you know, like having an hour, hour and a half podcast, if it's chock full of intentional content, great. But if it could be 30 minutes and you're saying it in an hour, hour and a half, cut it. So that's, it's like reading books. You know, there's, it's so funny. I'm reading right now, Made to Stick by Chip and, Chip and Dan Heath. Right. Yeah. I remember that. Which book. is a fantastic book. But ironically, they talk about making it simple and yet profound. And yet the book is 350 or 60 pages. <laughs> And I'm thinking, you know, you guys are talking about making it simple and profound. You could have cut this book in half. Really? I mean, realistically, they could have. I know that there's something to be said about writing a long book. It's it's some kind of a thing, and I get that. But at the same time, it it got me thinking, not to criticize them at all, because I, I love what they're talking about. Uh, but it just got me thinking, like, hmm, interesting. That's the old world of publishing where people would buy the book by the pound. And, uh, exactly. and that's the info product world, too, when it's at least non-digital content. You know, I remember I had one of the authors of the Steve Jobs book on uh, my show right after he passed away. And I, I constantly heard after his death about how he always said the the difficult thing is to make it simple. Simplicity is difficult and it requires a lot of discipline, you know, to just keep it simple. That's a very important point that you make. Yeah. You know, and it's funny because going back to even the original question you were asking me, I made it complicated. It it comes down to, you know, how, how do we get better with our podcasts when it comes to our presentation? And it really comes down to master your craft. Just, just get good at whatever it is that you need to do when it comes to your podcast. So if you don't speak well, or if you've got crappy equipment, or your content's all over the place, or your co-host isn't good, whatever. Whatever the issue is, look at it and say, how can you cure your average? Master your craft. Make it excellent. Do your everything it takes. And that's what I'm doing on my show is, is helping people to do that because I think that's the thing that most of us are missing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Good stuff. Well, very, very good. I just want to leave it open for you, but first give out your website if you would, Brian. Sure. It's ProfitCastUniverse.com. Profit. That's a great name, ProfitCast. Uh, I love it. Good, good name. That was one of those accidents. You yeah. know? <laughs> like a, it was a mashup of it, words, and I thought, how do I profit with my ProfitCast? It, my pot, yay! It, it's a great brand. No question about it. Thank it's you. very memorable. You. you know, just any, any closing thoughts, tips, ideas, what the future holds in podcasting, you know, just anything you want to share with people. You know, one thing I'll share is, is just making sure that you know, if you're a podcaster, it, it's really a great idea to take a step back and look at it. Set, put yourself in, in the seat of your listener and ask yourself, if I, was, if I was my own listener, would I listen to my own podcast? Is this something that I would love? And, and again, write down, okay, yeah, I like it. Of course I like it. Do you like it? I mean, as a host, but then writing down things that you could say, I could really do better at this, or this is something that I am just rocking. It's awesome. You know, keep it. Don't fix something, that, obviously, that isn't broken, right? So, so you know, making sure that you can really take those ideas and, and figure out ways to continually improve and continually practice and get better. Asking for advice, 
don't think you know it all. You know, if you've got questions, you know, relish the the failures because the failures help you to learn, help you to pivot to the right thing too. But as far as the future of podcasting, you know, my only advice would be this: as we know, you you mentioned this earlier that that AM radio is going to be a thing of the past when podcasting continues to grow. I would say, you know, we're in we're in the business of broadcast. Broadcast has been around for thousands of years. It's just different forms of technology, and so to remember that. If you are a broadcaster in that sense and you love sharing something, you know, podcasting is phenomenal right now. And I think it will be for many years, but like anything, technology will change. And so, you know, I don't know what's going to come of the future of podcasting, but I always look at it as be prepared for the next adaptation of technology. Mm -hmm. Very good point. Whatever that may be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as Peter Drucker said, the one constant is change. So it's not always going to be like this. It's not always going to be the same. And, you know, we'll see what happens with the uh, the media landscape in terms of podcasting. Yeah. Hey, one other thing I'm going to share real quick too. Love what you do. If you don't love it, change it. Because podcasting is, man, it's a lot of work. You got to be passionate about doing it and about the topic you're talking about. And if you're not, it's okay to change. Yeah. Yeah, good. So that's uh, you know, pivot or persevere. So that's mm-hmm. that's a that's a great point. Well, Brian, thank you so much for joining us today. This was a this was a great discussion and I think you've really got some good ideas about podcasting and you know where it should go and the future of it and the opportunity which is which is so big. Uh, so we appreciate having you on the show. Thank you, Jason. You know what? I'm still learning and it's exciting to continue to learn and, and be proven wrong in many ways too. So <laughs> Feel free to, to throw out your feedback and if you guys have suggestions and, and thank you for thank you for having me on, Jason. It's been it's been an honor. Yep. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc. exclusively.